And today's the 25th of September. All right. Hey, what's going on? It's Bill Burr, and it's time for the Monday Morning Podcast. For Monday, did I say podcast? Podcast for Monday, September 25th, 2017. What's going on? How are you? What's up? I am back from uh, Toronto, Canada, and every once in a while, every once in a long while, I have a, I have a guest, and I always get good guests, and this is no, today is no exception. We have the great Felipe Esparza on here, who has a uh, welcome, first of all. Welcome. Thanks for having me. What's up, fool? There you go. Felipe Esparza from the What's Up, <coughs> Fool podcast. And uh, let's get all the hype out of the way at first. We got, uh, you have a new HBO special. Yes, a new HBO special on September 30th at 10. September 30th at 10 on HBO. That's where the HBO specials are called Translate This. So uh, let's get into it. Tell me about that. What was it like to shoot an uh, hour-long special for HBO? Um, it, was, it was good. Um, I shot it myself. Um, I, I, um, I got the money together. I saved up some money. And my wife and I, we, um, we chose San Jose Improv, and we got Claude Shires, uh-huh. and um, it was all DIY, you know. So you did it yourself, yeah. and then HBO liked it so much? They bought it. Oh, so when you were doing it, you were thinking like, holy shit, HBO. I'm doing an HBO special. I don't know where it's going to go. Like, I hope it goes to Netflix somewhere, <laughs> even Amazon. No, but that's, I think that's a, uh, that's a great way to do How the fuck is nobody giving you a shot? I don't know. You know why. You're not white like me. <laughs> um, I got to be honest, before we, I did this, you know, I always look up like uh, videos and all that type of stuff to make sure I got something to talk about so it doesn't become this, like my biggest fear with these interviews is it's just going to become this horrific staring contest because I'm such a huge fan of what you do. And I had never seen the, um, the Ari Shafir, when Ari Shafir was hosting the show, uh, This Isn't Happening. Yeah. When you told that whole story about uh, being in the gang and fighting the guy biting his ear off and shit. It's just like, like I was listening to that, that story. It was like, this is like at least three different Tarantino movies. <laughs> and then you, you ended it in just such a nice place. Um, I don't want to force you to tell the story again, I, but if you could just recap. I don't mind. Um, I like, grew, start by, where, where did you grow up? I grew up in um, Boyle Heights, California, you know, Los Angeles, but East LA. But it's East called LA. Boyle Heights. You know, East LA is like further... East, east, east of Los <laughs> Angeles, you know, it's by almost close to Monterey Park. But Boyle Heights is the neighborhood. Wait, right wait, after- how far away is that? To put it in white perspective, how far away is that from the Staples Center? Ooh, I, if I were to walk, it would take me like an hour. An hour so and if a you half. were to drive, probably fifty minutes with fifteen LA traffic. minutes. Okay, cool. A thirty-minute bus ride. Okay, thirty-minute bus ride. So you grew up. Uh, what you, what what decade? You're a child of what? Eighties. You're the eighties. I grew up in the eighties. So that was the real deal. Yeah, I grew up in my neighborhood was in the housing projects, mm-hmm. Pico Gardens, and there was like three separate housing projects. There was Aliso Village, Pico Aliso, and then Pico Gardens from First Street to like Sixth Street. Okay. And there was like shit, man. There was like a shitload of gangs, like maybe eleven. How did you know when you're not in a gang and you're a young kid, how do you negotiate? Like, I got to get from my house. To, I got to go pick up my, my fuck. I got to go do my laundry. I got to go to school. How do you negotiate? Uh, is it uh, now a gang's 24 7? Oh, yeah, man. They're 24 7. In that neighborhood, they were 24 7. See, I, I, I always thought they came out around five. Like, anybody with, like, <laughs> just living the regular lifestyle goes to bed and then they just kind of give up this. The area there, and then those you, gangs that come out at five, they're like the gangs that, that that are still living in a gentrified neighborhood. Oh, okay, they don't come out in the daytime because <laughs> they might call the cops on them. Oh, okay. but yeah, man. But most gangs, you know, from Echo Park, they come out at night, man, robbing people. Really? Yeah, they come out at night. Those gangs, where, where were the gentrification? Those gangs are still around, but they come out at night and they gang bang at different areas, you know. But they're still gang banging. They so don't how, forget. How, how old were you the first time uh, you got mugged? I got mugged um, the first time when I was like 18 years old. My friend um, Coco. That's pretty good, man. Yeah, I, I was, got mugged I was 18. downtown crossing when I was like in eighth grade. That I was like, I was, I was selling crack on my first day. Like the, within one hour, I got robbed. Somebody put a knife behind my back, another knife in, my, like in front of me, and they took all my, my crack away. Took all your crack away? So yeah. then, then what do you have to do? Oh, I had to go back to the guy who gave it to me, a friend of mine who I grew up with. You know, he passed away already. 
they used to call him Coco. Uh-huh. And we grew up together. Him and I were um, from second grade to adults. I needed money at the time. I got somebody pregnant, and I didn't know how to make money. So I asked him for a job in the criminal business. Can I, you know? <laughs> hey, man, I had no money. How does that go down? You're probably I trying to avoid me. it. It's like, I don't want to sell drugs, but I, I kind of have to now. I got a kid coming. So help me. So he gave me like $100 of, of crack, you know, 100 So he was just bring me back 100 then I give you more to sell. So as soon as I got out, they didn't know who I was in that neighborhood. They just came around me and they took all my stuff. They didn't hurt me or anything. I was begging for my, just, can I keep my ID? And they gave my ID. Oh, they did. How scared were you? I was scared, man. I thought they were going to kill me right there. I was, I felt like I was young. I was really scared. But I was calm, you know. I wasn't like, uh, right. just take it, man. Just take it. Leave me alone. You know, I just walked out of it. Take it. I didn't fight them or nothing because I knew they would have killed me or stabbed me or worse. So I went back to my friend Coco, and I told him what happened. And I, and I thought, you know, he was going to be okay, man. You know, it's all right. You know, it's your first day. It happens. Day. It happens. <laughs> no, man. Man, that night escalated. Like, it took with it. I, He gave me the crack at like around midnight. I got robbed around one thirty. At 2 30 <laughs> in the morning, I'm back at his house. What? Who robbed you, cuz? So, what happened? He gave me a gun. He Jesus gave me a pistol. Christ. And he got himself a pistol. And he, and he put a, a blue handkerchief on his, on his head. And, and he put a black beanie on, and we both went looking for those guys. And you must have been praying to God, like, I don't want to murder somebody the first time. Oh, hell yeah. I was praying, please don't find those guys. Wow. Because right there, I was like, I would have probably done anything he would have told me. I was vulnerable. I was weak. Right. You know, I have no, I don't know what to do. So we went together, and we saw one guy that saw what happened, but he didn't do anything. And. And then, like, he kind of, like, hit him real hard. And who did it, man? Where are they at? Then I say, man, it wasn't him, man. It wasn't him. So it wasn't him. Wait, how did that hit? So you go, oh, I, there's a, I remember that guy standing there watching me get yeah. robbed. So now this poor bastard gets dragged into it. He gets dragged into it. And he, got, like, he got, like, gun slap, you know, by my friend. He, my friend didn't even ask him no question. He just hit him in the face hard, man. And, like, he started bleeding from his ear. And I, and, I, and I just said, wow, man. He was looking at me like, come on, man, please tell him it wasn't me. <laughs> so you waited till after the pistol slap. Oh, I, I, I meant, meant to tell you this. It wasn't him. So we got, nothing happened to him, and we went back. And later on, those guys who actually did it walked back and gave it back, or everything, gave back the crack to that guy. And everything was cool. Because what, he had... They said, sorry, we didn't know that. They, they were afraid of that guy? Yeah, sorry, we didn't know Batman was with you. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was your street nickname. Yeah. We so then know. after that, then they knew that you were with him, so then people stopped fucking with you. People stopped messing with me, yeah. Jesus Christ. This is what kills me about you, is you have like a thousand of those stories, and you're the most relaxed, laid-back guy ever. Like, where did it all go? Because, dude, I look at me. I, I sound like I lived your life, and you sound like you lived my life. Like, you sound like you grew up in a nice little cul-de-sac area and played street hockey, and I'm all fucking wound up. How, how did you do that? Well, I have, a mom, I have parents. I have my mom and dad and most of my crazy friends in the projects. You know, the crazier ones, they didn't have a mom and dad. Right. Like they had nobody telling him, you better come home early, or there was nobody telling those kids to come home when the lights go on in the streets. So they had no, really nobody telling them what to do, how to live right, no discipline. I have my mom and dad. My dad worked, and my mom stood. My mom worked at a elementary school. At the they nurse. were like, "Be home from selling crack when the uh, street lights came on, right?" Yeah, yeah. You had that. <laughs> but I've always you had that family foundation. But I've always. But Wait, I've, I don't get that. I just now you're talking. You had a home life, but you're telling you you're doing all this other but shit. But when I was a kid, you know, when I was like 13, 12, 14 years old, I was in crazy. Oh, oh, I, I got see. What crazy you're saying. after high school. Oh, after I got okay. someone pregnant, I just didn't know what to do. But I was always like a little hustler, man. My mom would saw Avon, and I would go collect the money for her. Uh-huh. You know, so I learned how to collect money for people, at least. For my mom, was always selling Her- um, Herbalife, Avon. She was always selling something. Because we lived by the warehouses in downtown LA where the factories are at, uh-huh. where all the trucks would come in and pick up stuff from the trains and take them to, like, stores. So my mom knew where, like, we used to go to this one factory, and we, we used to um, put a bunch of that synthetic cotton, the plastic one, they would throw it away. 
My mom and I would put it in bags, like hefty bags. Mm-hmm. And then we go to another place where they would throw these raggedy old sheets. And then my mom would sew those raggedy old sheets with the cotton. And then we'll, we'll go to door-to-door, door-to-door in a housing project selling pillows. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys were a real green family, man. You were there. You were there recycling. That's Everything wonderful. Everything we sold, we put in the trash, and we sold it like we sold pillows. I used to when I was like fourteen. <laughs> I used to walk to downtown. What LA. would you do with pallets? Would you build a little house and then sell that? <laughs> <laughs> no, man, that, that's too much work. I want. We want fast money. Oh, okay. Cash. Uh, there was a bunch of factories where I lived, you know, I felt like I felt like Henry Hill from Goodfellas. Right. Because they were always stealing stuff from the airport and we were always taking stuff from these factories. I wasn't stealing from these factories. My friends were. I was taking stuff from the trash. Like um there was, there was a watermelon factory and they would throw away rotten watermelons and I would get the watermelons and cut them in what half. What is a watermelon? W- like they, they make watermelon like they throw them. Like, they thought you grew them. No, they, they would get them from the farmer, I guess, and they, right. they would hold them there. They have pallets full of watermelon from, because there's like a grocery area of downtown LA where every grocer oh, gets all this gets stuff. Other stuff, flowers, stereos, you know, uh, you name it, piñatas. I know where everything is at. Suits, cheap suits. I know where everything's at. So we get the so water. you would hang out with, and just go to the dumpsters, and whatever they threw out, you would then go sell. Yeah, I would cut that watermelon in half and then go sell it to the Mexicans, day laborers, everybody that's working in the factories, a bunch of, bunch of immigrants. Right. And I would sell the, the half a watermelon for a dollar, two dollars, <laughs> five. <laughs> I would just cut the rotten piece off, you know what I mean? Or every once in a while, nobody's looking. I would send my little homegirl, this girl, the little lesbian. Well, she's a lesbian now, but we didn't know she was a lesbian now. She was like a tomboy. Right. I would send her in there with my brother, and they would, they would like... When there were nobody was looking, they would throw good watermelon in the trash can too. So we had a mixture of good and bad watermelons. How long did you stay in that whole world of selling crack and all of that and, and all those fights and biting the guy's ear off and all that shit before you became a comedian? Like how long how long was that period of your life? That was my period of from eighteen years old to like twenty one and a half. Twenty one and a half. Because at twenty one is when I was like messing up already, man. I was like I'm I was smoking a lot of PCP. That was like my drug of choice at, right. for the time being. And man, I used to get all what crazy. Is PCP? PCP is like, I think it's a- elephant tranquilizer. That's, That's what, what that people is. tell me. I used to always hear that growing up. PCP, angel dust, and all that. And yeah, angel, I, I, angel dust is like um, a crystallized PCP. You could put it in a cigarette. But PCP, in my neighborhood, we were at the PCP capital of, the, of Los Angeles. Like in the my hub. neighborhood, they sold gallons of it. People had two. They would have um, sparkless water full of PCP. So everybody had PCP. Wait a minute. And you, you, how, how, did, how did you ingest it? You smoked it? No, you, you, you did like a... Uh, I'm giving away secrets here. I'm, I'm, no, no, I don't no, want to... No, 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 I'll tell I'm, you. I'm asking because everybody tries to act like no, they understand all this no, shit. Man. I'm a booze house, menthol. so I, I don't know any of that stuff. You will get a Newport cigarette, oh, preferably okay. a menthol cigarette, a Newport, and then you put you, or you, and you dip it inside like a little jar... Like um, just a tip, and that's a five dollar tip. That's a five dollar dip. You dip it again, that's ten. You dip a whole one, it's twenty. You know, <laughs> you you soak it, it's thirty dollars. You know, it's by dip. You know. No, I get it. That's like when I drink booze. There's like the ten year old <laughs> shit, the yes. twelve year old, all the way up to twenty five. Then you get into the cognacs, and they can be like I don't know, like a, I don't know, wines and shit could be like a century year old or something. So there's one night. I'm smoking PCP. Like, just because I'm stupid as hell when it comes to it. So what is it? What's that high like? Is oh, it- man. It's like you're the Incredible Hulk oh. <laughs> if somebody attacks you. Oh, this is a shit when like five cops show up and they got to get see five that, more. Did you see that Charles Bronson movie? Death Wish 3? When yes. That one white boy, like a surfer, he's, been, he's fighting all the police officers. He's on PCP. Oh, okay. I got to rewatch that. Yeah, man. PCP, you, you think you have... um. Like incredible whole strength, but you just have like more, you don't feel pain while people are hitting you, man. You, you could just keep attacking forever, you know what I mean? Right. And then the next morning you wake up and you and, feel like you played 12 years in the NFL. Yeah, man. All right. So the first time you smoke PCP and that shit hits you, it's like literally like you're turning into like a superhero. Yeah, man. I, but the one time. What when did I, you do? Did you try to bend something? Nah. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's what I would have done. Fart cops now. No. <laughs> that's what I would have done. I would have tried to pull something off the fucking wall. I better get the around now. Well, the, when I was like walking around, there, there, people I was, I was becoming to be known as Batman. You know, he's crazy. Watch out for him. Why did they call you? Why did they call you Batman? Because um, I love Batman, and I used to wear my my those um those superhero underoos. Uh huh. At eighteen. Yeah, man. Still, well, the Batman shirt still fits, so I wore it. And I don't know where to get a Batman shirt anywhere else. It was the Underoos factory right down the street? <laughs> you took it out of the dumpster. To the Bat Projects. Yeah. That's amazing. All right, so you're doing all that. I'm watching, um, I'm at the drive-in theater with my friends, smoking PCP, watching Terminator 2. Asking, what, I, I, saying I'd fight that guy. Yeah, man. And, and I was thinking about the guy that had been bullying me for the last two weeks. So I, I go. I now go. wait. If you smoke that, say say a guy of you is. I, I shouldn't do this because I'm like doing a commercial here for the drug. Say there's somebody bullying you. You can't beat that guy, right? If you were to smoke some P, PCP, it definitely would give you the belief. But can it overcome how slow you are and your inability to slip a punch and all? You just walk through his shit. Yeah, man. You just throwing punches because um, when I when I got into a fight with this guy, I was, they told me I was doing things that I don't remember doing. Like they they told me that I took my belt off and I was whipping them all over the. All right, you got to. We keep alluding to the story. You got to tell the story, right? So you're right. Batman. You got on your underoos. You smoke PCP at the drive-in. You saw the Terminator Two. When I left the Terminator Two movie, I come back in the project and I see this guy that he's like an old dude, man. He's like 30 years old. He just came out of prison. He don't know who I am. He's like calling me bad names, and um pushing me and pushing me and I don't want to fight him pushing me then finally I socked him in the face but I kind of missed then he hit me right in the eye and he hit me hard and my eye got black right away and he punched me in the face I started bleeding then he started choking me so when he started choking me that's when I like I went crazy <laughs> I went crazy man I lifted him up dropped him bit his, I bit his ear off first of all I bit his you ear turned off. into the Hulk I bit his ear off man I was like the Hulk Hogan let me tell you brother let me ask you this. When you bit his ear off, were you underneath or you were on top of him? I was like underneath him. He was choking me. And you just, all of a sudden, that PCP kicked I bit in. it off, man. I, I never thought, man, skin is so easy to bite off. And Yeah, well, that, I spit, that thing gross you out or I, No, not even, man. I spit it out and I started punching him. And then my friends told me that. Um, Wait, what did he do? Oh, man, he took the hits like a soldier. So when you bit his ear off, this guy still swinging. He freaked swinging. out. He's, he's screaming like a little girl. Okay. He's All in right. pain. So Actually, he's kind of screaming like a guy who got his ear bit off. I yeah, mean, he's I, screaming, I think at that man. point, I think you're still a man if you, if you go up a few octaves when you're missing a fucking ear. But I, I don't know why I bit his ear off. I mean, I, had no, I guess I had no choice, you know. He was choking me. It sounded like that was the move. No one was helping me. He wasn't, didn't seem like he was going to be stopping. All right, so you beat, you, then you took your belt off and you were... My friends told me that I took him, my belt off and I started whipping him. <laughs> like, he was like chasing him with a belt, whipping him like, a, like he was like a runaway property or something. And how many people are witnessing this? I think like 12, 15 people. But they're all like cheering me on, cheering him on. Nobody's helping. Do you know how many hits that would get like nowadays if they were... If, Dude. That would be... <laughs> That would be like, it would be epic PCP guy. <laughs> epic belt guy. There'd be something like that. I would have been in a rap song, auto-tune, Batman. Rrr, rrr, rrr. Yeah. So wait a minute. So when you, so you don't remember doing that. So there was like, oh, fuck, this guy's going to kill me. Then you start to bite his ear off. You're like, wow, ears come off really easily. Then you sort of black out. And then and like, well, you just sort of came to with like blood all over you going like, uh, the Did next, I just eat a hot dog or something? Yeah, the next day I wake, <laughs> the next day I'm walking around. It's like 10, it's 7 in the morning, 8 in the morning. I don't know, man. I'm looking at my body. It's full of blood. My pants, my face. You know, my, I have a black guy. My shirt is full of blood. I have no idea what happened. I have no idea what happened. You probably thought it was your blood. Yes, don't I, know, why? I don't I really know. Like, whoa, attitude. man. I, I was like checking to see if I got shot or stabbed by somebody. I didn't know. Then my friends told me what happened, and the guy was in the he went to the hospital for a, like a broken ribs, a missing um, ear, missing ear, you know. What are you just putting neosporin on that? How's that? Work? <laughs> <laughs> and they went to. He was laying in bed, and they asked him if um, do you want to press charges? You know, because everybody know there was witnesses. Everybody knew who did it, and um, he said no. 
we're gonna handle the right way. And I was like, Uh-oh. and I, I didn't even know know this until later on, like a week later. He goes, "Yeah, man, I think there's like a green light on you right now." And he means like green light. What do you mean green light? Yeah, man, shoot to kill if they see you. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? So that's the first time you ever heard that. So now, yeah. what, now what do you do besides not go outside? Do they know where you live? They know where I live, but I don't know. What, look, he's still in a hospital, though, but everything's calm, you know, but he's still in a hospital. But I, I could feel tension from people who, are, who I thought were my friend at one time, who I, who I grew up with, you know. You know, they were turning on me, like, because I was never in their gang. I was in another gang. When you watch The Wire, do you, like, fall asleep? Is it, like, boring to you? Because I never you watched The Wire. <laughs> you don't need to. You lived yeah. it. That's what I'm saying. Like, it sounds like uh, an award-winning series to me. I'm more like blood in, blood out. <laughs> so, wait a minute. So now, now there's a green light on you. Yeah. And, okay? Um, At some point, you got to go outside to get food because you're hungry. Yeah, so I'm what's about, a, when you have a green light on you in in East LA, what's a good time to go out to, if you got to go hit hit the Mayfair Market or whatever? What's a good oh, time man, to head out? Oh man, the best thing to go to do right when you have, when you have a green light in in, in um, from anybody, you know whether it comes from prison or if it comes from just the neighborhood, it's just leave, man, move somewhere safe like Modesto. <laughs> <laughs> what what's a more Serious green light. If it came from prison or from the neighborhood, or they oh man! Them? If it come from prison, you're a dead man, man. I mean, there's nowhere to go. There, there's nowhere to go, man. And um, I, I read about these things, you know, on television, on books. There's no way coming back from that. But there was like only like a green light from his neighborhood, you know. Can't you like, just go to the mall. No, just man. go to like the Grove, pick a really white mall, and just... uh, you know what? All those thoughts came to my mind at that time. Like, man, I wish I was like the French Prince of Bel Air. <laughs> I had a, I had a, a rich white guy to take a, a rich white guy or a rich fucking Mexican guy. Oh know? no, wait, they weren't with on that show. That was different strokes. That was different strokes, but right. the drumming. They switched it up. They're like it's different strokes, except the Never parents are black. Never thought about it yeah. right now. Yeah, that's what they always they, they always do that shit. So my mom called um, Father Greg Boyle. He's like this priest that I grew up with in the neighborhood. He's from the Homeboy Industries. Here in LA, that's a, that's a thing. Yeah, he helps. He helps um, gang members. That's a cool name. All right, Father Mom. Greg Boyle, he's like a priest from my neighborhood, and um, he's always helped the neighborhood. Like, he would go out his way to help people. He would like if you like if he's so driving, he, and then you like he will pick up kids that were drunk off the streets and take them home. He did that a couple of times for me in a good way. In a good way, yeah. Like if you're a gang member in the wrong neighborhood and then. You know, you're pretty much, someone's going to kill you in that neighborhood. Father Greg Boy will tell you, get, get in the van. I'll Wait, take you back home. How, as, a, as, as a gang member, how do you end up in the wrong neighborhood other than a woman? Oh, man. I'm PCP. Oh, there, goddamn PCP. There's right? no, you, you there's no heroin bulletproof? in your neighborhood, so now you're going to go buy heroin somewhere else. You know, there's no crack in the neighborhood. You know, there's, it's a dry spell somewhere, and you got to get high, so you got to go to another neighborhood and buy it. Oh, God. Or you have an aunt. So how do they know you're in a different gang? You don't go over there wearing your whole, your, your, your colors, right? Oh, man, the, the, most of the, the hardcore gang members, they wear their colors, man. They, they're not going to stop wearing their colors. Oh, boy. They're not undercover. <laughs> they're 24-7. But I wasn't, one, I wasn't even one of those guys. I was nothing like that. I was just a guy who was just hanging around with these kids. Then one day I get jumped into a gang, and I'm getting into so much trouble. But I have I don't, no How idea. How long is to get beaten into a gang? Just in case I ever fuck my life up and I go to prison. You know, when I go to prison, my only hope is I got to join the Aryan Nazi guys. <laughs> I got to listen to their bullshit and pretend I believe it just to save myself. How long is that beatdown? Um, well, in, in, in the streets, it would be like, I guess whatever number the gang is. So if it's 18th Street, you're going to get beat up for 18 seconds. That's it? Yeah. Or, but, but, I mean, how many guys? Uh, all of them. Oh, Jesus. Okay. Fuck. Can, can I strike the that's it from the record there? Because when I got jumped in, I was just hanging out, man. Like, I was just hanging out. And then somebody said, um, hey, man, you want to get jumped in? And I wasn't going to say no. If I say no, I'm a punk. I'm going to get jumped in. I'm going to get jumped for being a punk. <laughs> So I said, fuck it, let's do it. And then I punched the guy next to me for no reason. Well, because I want to prove that I'm, I'm, I'm tough. So the guy next to me, I just knocked him out with one punch, man. 
And then I hit, <laughs> like he wasn't even looking. I said, let's do this. And then like I hit him, man. You know, you, you, you got to be ready, big dog. <laughs> you got to look out, homie. And that's that Warren Sapp moment. Keep your head on the swivel. <laughs> look I, bet, I bet he gave the other guy shit later. Like, hey, next time you're going to jump somebody in. Can you not say it when I'm sitting right next to him? <laughs> you knew he was a lefty. What the fuck? So yeah. you get beat up, and I, and, I get and, jumped by everybody. Like those, so, you uh, get one in, and did, did you get more than one in? Did you get one in? I got two in, one him and another guy. But then after that, I felt like um, Nike Cortex all over my face. <laughs> <laughs> so you're just laying on the ground, and you're just going one Mississippi, two, but just waiting for this rain of of Foot Locker to stop coming down on you. Yeah, man, I, I was like, I thought I was never gonna stop, man. So what do you do? I would just Oh, they up. finally they stop. Yeah. All right, hit enough, hit enough. Then everybody's hugging me. The same people that were beating my brains up were hugging me and kissing me. You, I love you. You're my boy. You're my family now. And they're like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so then you come home, okay, and then you're just sitting there, all right, with fucking sneaker marks all over you, and you're going like, okay, now I guess I'm in a gang. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Okay, so then what happens? Um, I started, what happened was I started hanging this around. Is, you know, when white people talk about white privilege going, dude, what the fuck is this? This is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. You can sit there selling lemonade at the end of your driveway. And but not there was, worry um, about accidentally. Did I just join a gang? There was, hey, um, there's a green light on you. You were selling lemonade <laughs> at the end of the wrong driveway. You're okay. in the wrong neighborhood. Okay. There was, um, but th- you know, like there was two white boys. In my neighborhood, that were gangs. Was one the redheaded kid from Children of the Corn? Exactly, he was. He was. His, well, there was one guy. He was a blood. Actually, Malachi. He was from East LA. Snowman, they called him. Okay. There was uh, yeah, there was actually two white boys. I find man. that offensive, by the way. But continue. There was two white boys in the hood, man, and they were both gangbangers. And one thing about white boy cholos, like when you see a white boy join a gang, like when you see a white guy, like someone like you, and you're hanging around with nothing but Mexicans. They're white white guys are the most craziest gangsters when they're in a Mexican gang. They do stuff that a Mexican man would never think of. Like I remember this one white guy, Snowman. He was a blood. He said, "Man, let's go do a home invasion," and I, and everybody was asking him where. He goes, "My mom's house." Oh, he wanted a home game. All right, <laughs> that's not right. <really. laughs> he wanted them. He wanted all the, all the homies to rob his house. Because he wanted his mom and dad to get robbed. Why? Because I don't know. That was probably his idea. They were mad. They're probably saying, "Stop hanging out with all those Mexicans." <laughs> probably, like, man. That was like, his idea. You. And I was like, "Damn." So they probably behaved that way because they they felt no matter what they, they they had to constantly prove. Constantly, man. Because technically, they could just get a haircut or whatever, put away the flannel, and just slip slip away, man. Slip away down at the Grove. Slip away, become a social worker, and that'll be it. So how long were you in this gang for, and did you ever get beaten out? No, I was in this gang to, um, I, uh, when um, Father Greg Boyle, when I bit that guy's ear off, I went to rehab. My Father Greg Boyle took me to rehab, and um, I, I disappeared for, I'm still gone. I never went back. Oh, you never went back. Oh, all yeah. Right. When you get uh, beaten out of a gang, how, uh, how long is that beat, though? As long as they want to. Um, I know we ha- I had a guy on the podcast named Fabian who was in a, in a gang, and he talked about he got beat, beat out. He got jumped out, and he said that when he got jumped, it just lasted longer. But um, his uncle <laughs> is still in the gang. It was so kind of like a, a simple his, expression. His Damn. uncle is, in, is still in the gang, so his uncle oversaw him getting jumped out so he didn't get hurt that bad. Oh, I don't have an uncle. Oh, okay. I, I probably would have got killed if I would have got jumped out when, when I was 20. But now, so, the white version of that is our dad's the judge, so we don't go to jail or whatever the fuck we just did. Your version is, uh, you, you, you got an uncle that oversees being jumped out. I, I got to tell you, dude, I'm, I'm learning all kinds of stuff. I, I, wonder, I don't know, in my case, somebody's just walking by somebody's recorder. It always feels weird to have to, like, re-hype something. So you're special on HBO. You shot yourself learning all of your do-it-yourself stuff from fucking going around to those warehouses, making pillows out of, out of nothing. Um, you ended up shooting this at uh, the uh, the Improv in San Jose, which is one of my favorite clubs. Isn't that a great club? Because yes, you feel like is. you're doing a theater, even yeah. though even though it's a club. It's tremendous. And uh, you shot it there. It's going to be on HBO September 30th at 10 o'clock called Translate This. 
Now, are you, um, I know you're a great joke writer, but you, uh, I saw in Ari Shafir's, you told that, you told the amazing story that you, you touched on today. Um, is your st- uh, stand up style in this more joke telling, more storytelling, or both? You know what? My, my comedy special is, it's more about, um, it's more about how I got to this country with my parents and um, being a, a single father and being a cheater. But, <laughs> yeah, man, I cheat a lot. I get caught cheat, cheating all the time. I'm bad. I can't help it. I love women. <laughs> I talk about getting caught cheating because I was caught cheating. You know, um, Bert, both girls showed up to my house. Oh, God. You know what I mean? And they, and man, it was crazy. And they asked me, what do you got to say for yourself? How long Checkmate. Wa- How long was that beat down? Was that oh, longer man. than 18 seconds? It was crazy. They did, showed did, up in it, the same what, what's car. The, what's it, oh, they, they talked to each other. Yeah, man. Well, now they film it and shit, and then you go in there, and then you got to do like an apology and all of that shit. The Jeez. first 48. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. So you got to do it. I can't wait to see this. But, um. Special. I can't, I really honestly do. All right. As a stand-up comedian, I cannot wait to see this thing. You're one of the most interesting dudes. I've been, how are you so fucking happy-go-lucky? I don't get it. I don't know. I just love life. You know, I'm never, I'm never going to go back to that type of lifestyle that I had in my 20s. And um, I just love living life, man. And I'm not going to say that I'm perfect because um, I did fall off the... I was... Well, right after I went to rehab, I was sober for 11 years. Like, I, I didn't touch no drugs. I didn't trust no alcohol, no beer, nothing. But um, along the way, you know, the, the more I did stand-up comedy, the more, you know, I did it. I, not going nowhere. I went back to smoking crack. You went right back to crack? Mm-hmm. So you never really were a booze guy, huh? No. It's probably, I don't know, booze, the more I mean, studies they do, it's like the worst. Uh, uh, Ralphie May do. retweeted my tweet the other night, and um, I don't understand what he meant at first. Because I was in Houston, and he retweeted, um, watch out for those spoons, bro. And I'm like, what the hell is Ralph Ray talking about them spoons? So then I said, oh, shit. Bert, well, I got it, so it, it's, coked it's, it, out in um, Houston, Texas. I, I, I oh, they're known for that there? Yeah, I couldn't I do that. no more coke because my nose were bleeding. So I wanted to rock it up and smoke it in crack instead, you know. Cause I wanted, I oh, wanted, so you're just like I'm just gonna snort a couple of lines. Yeah. What, but, what did you did you anticipate? Like were you like fuck this when I go to Houston I'm gonna party, or it was was it just a spontaneous thing and all of a sudden you just said fuck it? Oh man, I just I was over there. I was working the laugh stop in Houston. Shout out to uh, Pete, always booking me, Pete, and I'm from the laugh stop. Um, I got I, I got I started partying, man. I I I started partying and. I couldn't find no powder, no coke. So um, I hope you don't mind me telling this, but I, I called him Joe Diaz. I said, hey, Joe Diaz, you know anybody over here? You call him at 6 in the morning, cocksucker. <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with you? Call him at 6 in the morning, you fucking cocksucker. Ah, That's I know, a great I, Joey. I know somebody. <laughs> 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 so I, I knew he knew somebody. Another he he um he goes talk to this comedian. So I spoke to this comedian, and then um this little Mexican fool showed up all week, taking care of me. I give him free tickets every day. Oh, thank you. And um, I I don't know what happened, man, but I I, I did too much coke, and another, I felt like <laughs> I can't do no more coke through my nose. You know something's gonna go bad. I want to smoke crack now. You know what I mean? I don't want steak. I want burgers now. Dude, a reoccurring story with you is, I, I don't know what happened. Last time you didn't know what happened, you were whipping somebody with a belt. Now you don't know what happened. There's like a fucking hole in your nose. Jesus, dude, when, how long ago was this? This was in them, 2006. All right, so, you, okay, 2007, good. 2006. So you broke your record. You've gone, you've gone. Oh, no, it's 11. It's 11 years ago. Yeah. I called up um, room service because I wanted to smoke crack. And I, call, I can't believe I called up room service and I said, room service. I'm going to need um, a big spoon and a baking soda brought over right now. And they did not bring that to the room. Oh, they brought it, man. They did? Two guys brought it. The, the guy from the front desk, he knew me because um, I made friends with him already from previous times. And he brought it. And it was like a big spoon. And he brought Arm & Hammer baking soda. 
And the guy with him, he just was with him to laugh at me, I guess. He goes, yeah, I guess he couldn't believe it, you know. This guy just ordered baking soda and spoon. No way. Let's go see. <laughs> so they both open the door. I, they, they give it to me, and they both laugh. But, yeah, man, I wanted to smoke crack. Okay, so, and, and, then, and then how long were you off the wagon for? From when? Okay, so you're sober for 11 years. You go to Houston. You order a spoon and some baking soda. And now you, you, you snort Coke. Now you're smoking. I got, I, uh, you partied that weekend. Did you just come back and go, what the fuck was that? And were you able to, or did you have to go to rehab again? No, man. I continued partying, man, from that moment on. And the girl I was with, man, she ended up being a hermaphrodite. But that was another story for another time, you know. But, yeah. She sure. was a hermaphrodite. She, had, right. she was born with a penis and a vagina. Right. So, like, how long was she your girlfriend before you figured that out? Well, we were partying for three you nights must, You straight. must be a gentleman. <laughs> yes, that's what I was. I was a gentleman. I didn't want to touch her or nothing because she brought free coke, man. I can't be that guy. So I, I just kissed her a couple of times, but then by the third night, you know, we're, we were up for three nights straight, her and I. But when I finally found out, I was like, whoa, man, yeah, that's a big skin tag you got there. <laughs> <laughs> So was that enough? So was that enough to get you sober again? No, man. I, I didn't get sober again till two thousand nine. You blew through that stop sign. All right. So now we're still going. I didn't get sober till two thousand nine. Oh fuck! I was and off we, and, and on. You, and you were already doing. So during those periods, you were still doing stand up, and you were. You yeah, were I was doing stand up. I, I was even. Uh, I even uh, got to go to Montreal Comedy Festival in two thousand five, and. Um, I was bad. I did, I did the Young Comedian show, and I did well. I guess I did well. I got a little a little print on The Hollywood Reporter. I got an agent, UTA, actually, that they obviously year. Had, they didn't have any idea you were high? No, man. I was, on, I was smoking crack in Montreal, too. I hooked it up. I mean, I found crack in Montreal. It's funny. I, I saw a Mexican guy in Montreal, and I knew he spoke Spanish. And I told him, and how could you tell? I just could tell, man. He had the boots, you know. He had that look, like I, 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 I need a job, you know. I don't even know what that means. It's hilarious. <laughs> he got the boots, you know. He had that look, like I, I just got here, cross country. So he spoke Spanish. <laughs> he spoke Spanish, no English, but he, he knows how to speak French now, but with a Mexican. You know, Mexican accent. You he's know? doing all the romantic languages. He'll do so Italian, he went there, Mex- dum, 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 and he came back. A romance languages. Yeah, really man. Pur- pur- crack. Well, all right. Dude, you are, I, I, I could talk to you for like fucking 10 hours and you just don't run out. It's amazing, man. I don't know. Thank God you're still here. All but I'm the, sober all, now, all man. This, I know, but all this stuff you've done, you know, like realistically, you probably could have died in 80% of the stories you just Man, I'm glad told. I'm alive. Yeah. I am too, man, because I think you're a fucking amazing <laughs> comedian and person. I'm psyched that you're on the All Things Comedy Podcast Network with the What's Up Fool podcast. Um, I wish you nothing but the best with your, uh, your, your stand-up special. HBO, Saturday, September 30th. Set your DVRs, whatever the kids do now, your cord cutters, whatever you do to fucking see this thing. And uh, more success to you and uh, stay out of Houston. I will. Okay? What's up, fool? All right. Thanks, Felipe. Thanks, Bill Burr, Billy Burr. All right, that was Felipe Esparza, man. That fucking guy is amazing. Please check out his special. I just said all that shit. Uh, I got to do my reads here, and then I'm going to talk a little NFL football, maybe answer a couple of questions, fill out the rest of this hour here. Uh, All right, our first. Oh, Jesus, look who's back. It's old Zip. Rick Ruda. Um, Talk about the challenge of finding. I'm not doing that. Was Zip Recruiter. You can post your job to 100 plus, 100 plus job sites with just one click. Then their powerful technology efficiently matches the right people to your job better than anyone else. That is why. That is why. That's why Zip. Recruiter ah, is different. Unlike any other site, Zip Recruiter doesn't depend on candidates finding you. It finds them. In fact, 80% of employees who post jobs on Zip. Get a quality candidate through the site within one day. No more juggling emails. You don't have time for that shit or calls to your office. Simply screen, rate, manage candidates all in one place at ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use dashboard. Find out today why Zip 
has been used by businesses of all sizes to find the most quality job candidates with immediate results. And right now, my listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash Burr. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash Burr. One more time for free. Go to Zip. Recruiter.com slash Burr. Um, all right. MVMT, also known as Movement, the company that started well, was started by two broke college kids that wanted to wear stylish watches but couldn't afford them. They had no money, and somehow they started a watch company. Uh, so they started their own watch company. Um, how is this like how you started? Well, I didn't have any money, and I, then I started a comedy club. <laughs> I built my career. I don't know. Fuck it. What, I got to come up with like a metaphor here? Movement watches start at just $95 at a department store. You're looking at four to 500 bucks, and that's why people steal. No more shoplifting or boosting, whatever your people call it. Movement figured out that by selling online, they were able to cut out the middleman and retail markup, providing the best possible experience. Over 1 million watches sold in over 160 countries. Get 15% off today. With free shipping and free returns by going to movementwatches.com. That's M-V-M-T dot com slash Burr. This watch has a really clean design. Seriously, I've been getting compliments. And not just on my eyes. They're talking about the watch. Now is the time to step up your watch game. Go to M-V-M-T dot com slash Burr. Join the movement. And lastly, but certainly not leastly, stamps.com. The cornerstone of this podcast's advertisement. Avoid the hassle, man, of the post office and mail everything from postcards to envelope to packages, domestic or international. Create your stamps account in just minutes online with no equipment to lease and no long-term commitments. Click, print, mail, and you're done. Unlike the post office, stamps.com never closes. Print postage for letters or packages at your convenience 24-7. Keyword slash descriptors. I guess I'm supposed to say this. It's convenient. It's easy. It's reliable. It's flexible. All right? Just like your side piece there. Sorry. I use stamps.com because, uh, oh, I always, uh, whenever I sell posters at the end of my show, when I want to go out there and shake sweaty hands, you know, and I need to send out my posters, I use stamps.com, and I'm a moron. If I can figure it out, so can you. And right now, you too can enjoy the stamps.com service with a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus postage and a digital scale without long-term commitments. Go to stamps.com. Uh, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in Burr. That's stamps.com. Enter Burr one more time. Hey, stamps.com. Never go to the post office again. All right, that's it. Okay, stomach is growling here. I'm still on my fucking diet. Oh, Billy diet. Some fucking asshole sent me a tweet going like, you're obsessed with your fucking weight. You look fine. Get help. It's like, dude, that's why I look fine, you fucking moron. You don't give a shit, you potato skins eating fat fuck. These guys with your thick fucking torsos, you know what I mean? Making that noise when you reach back to get the seatbelt, trying to pull it around you, running out of material. I don't want to be that guy. You know what I mean? That guy who gets killed by his airbag because his fat face is too close to the the ex- miniature explosion. Um, anyways, All Things Comedy Festival, by the way, podcast festival, October 26th, 27th, 28th, 29th in Phoenix, Ticket links at BillBird.com. By the way, I am going to do my first ever live Monday morning podcast there at the Stand Up Live um, um, Comedy Club. I'm going to do it live. I'm, I'll do it live, and I'm going to do it just how I do it in my fucking house. All right? I thought about getting a guest, and I was like, fuck that. That's not the charm of what it is that I do. So I'm just going to do it. I don't know what. I'll lay down on the stage. I don't know what the fuck I'm going to do, but I'm, I'm going to do it the exact way I do. So if you ever wanted to see this shit live... This absolute train wreck. If you wanted to see what it looked like in real time, come on down to uh, the Stand Up Live Comedy Club in Phoenix, Arizona, October 28th. I will be there. I don't know when tickets go on sale. They on, I guess they're on sales now. They're on ticket links are at billbird.com. There you go. All right. Um, anyways, let's talk some NFL football. Did you guys enjoy it? Did your team win? My team won. The New England Patriots, who everybody said was going to go undefeated, and then we lost to the Kansas City Chiefs, and then everybody said, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I think Tom Brady is old now. 
I think he's washed up. I think the Kansas City Chiefs are going to win their first Super Bowl since 1970. That's what everybody said because the Kansas City Chiefs beat the New England Patriots in September. Now all of a sudden they can see January. How fucking crazy is that? Um, how many fucking times? How many times are you going to watch the Giants go 0-2 and 0-3 and, and just start writing them off? You saw all the points they scored. huh? You think they're not going to come back and beat Philly? They're not going to come back and beat Dallas later on this fucking year when they all get on the same page? They were protecting Eli much better, according to the 30 seconds of highlights that I saw. I'm sticking by my prediction. New England Patriots, New York Giants, Super Bowl rematch. All right? Until the Kansas City Chiefs, who I actually like. Until Andy Reid, who I'm not saying he's fat. Until those fuckers do something in January. All right? I think all of you need to sit down a little bit and fucking relax with all your shit talking. How many fucking guys have you seen throw for 500 yards in the regular season and get bounced out in the first round of the playoffs? How many times did you see a fucking guy zigzagging all over the field? You can't tackle him. And come playoff time, he's sitting on a fucking exercise bike wearing a tinted windshield across his eyes. Huh? The incredible lack of fucking respect that you gave our little quarterback that could, Tom Brady. How dare you? How dare you write off the New England Patriots after one fucking week? Huh? It's all wishful thinking. We're coming again. And we're going to take your hearts out. And we're going to pull them out of your chest. We're going to show them to you. And then we're going to underinflate them on our way to another fucking... Actually, we never got caught doing that. They just suggested that we did it and they got laughed out of court. Um, and then do I really need to address um, the stupid controversy of the fucking people taking a knee during the national anthem, you know, watching all these white people getting fucking upset by that, like it really, does it really affect your fucking life? And all these fucking idiots trying to make the point of what they're doing. It's not about your point, the people who started this thing. It's about my point. It's about the way that I see it, you know? I had a buddy of mine go, yeah, these fucking guys, they're making a million dollars, you know? You think it's bad here? Why don't you go fucking move to Syria? It's like, why do they have to move? Why can't they just live here the way you do? I don't understand that, and um, but Donald Trump is a fucking genius that he has everybody talking about this issue because he is trying to get everybody to stop focusing on the pool party he had with fucking Vladimir What's-His-Face over there in Russia. He doesn't want you watching that. He goes, oh, look at this over here, right? He goes down to Alabama, and he gets all them fucking people all riled up, and he keeps talking about this fatty over in fucking North Korea. That's what he's doing. It reminds me of when old fucking Slick Willie, you know, bombed that country because he stuck his cigar in that woman's nether region. This is the type of sick people that become president. This is what they do. All right. They get caught doing some fucked up shit. And then I will say this about Trump. At least he didn't go bomb some people. Unlike what's his face with his bitch hands who now gets treated like a fucking hero. I don't understand that guy at all. You know what I mean? Oh, how you doing? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I got caught getting my dick sucked in the Oval Office, so I bombed the country. I might have killed the baby, but I sleep like one every night. Um, I know. I'm a conspiracy theorist. I fucking hate them all. Did you see that thing? Uh, what's his face? It fucking uh, Korea considered that we declared war on him, right? So uh, uh, Maggie Magenhall, whatever her fucking name is, uh, Maggie Gyllenhaal. What is, the, what is the fucking, the poor woman who has to go out and fucking give the press conferences now because that dude with no neck, you know, who kind of looks like the political version of Roger Goodell went out there and fucked it all up. What the hell's her name? She's got a classic political name. I don't know what the hell it is. She said the fact that North Korea thinks that we're at war with them is absolutely preposterous or something like that. And then like a week before, what's his face? Trump basically tweeted like that that fatty over there wasn't long for this earth. It's like he kind of just said he's not going to last. He's not going to be around long. That's what he said. I mean, I would take that as a threat. Old haberdash versus haberdash. Um, you know what they really need to do? They both need to just go to a whorehouse together and fucking grow up, you know? Bang a couple of whores. They need to do a threesome, right? One of them's getting blown, the other's hitting it doggy style, and just their eyes meet, and they just start laughing. Being like, this is a great life, right? You got a personal chef too? Yeah, it's fucking amazing. You live in a castle, live in a white house. I mean, it's fucking, it's cool. They should just talk about, you know, 
trade stories the way comedians trade stories about bombing. They could just talk about fucking bombing other countries and I don't know what, fishing, whatever, whatever people at that level talk about. All right. Let's get to the questions for this week. So I, I don't have any fucking problem uh, with these these guys taking a knee. Uh, I try to listen to what it's about rather than getting wrapped up in what uh, what what it means to me. Um. All right, pharmacist writing in, dear Billy Bag Chaser. I don't know what that means. Um, by the way, people, thirty nine days sober. Thirty nine fucking days, and this is this is how well I'm doing with my sobriety. I, when I flew to Canada, I went by this duty free. And there's this uh, McCallum Rare Cast. They got this new one, Black Oak or some shit like that. And I was like, I'm going to buy that. Okay? I'm not going to take it to fucking Canada and then suck it down like a fucking jackass. I'm just going to have this thing waiting for me. You know what I mean? For whenever I fall off the wagon. So this is like what I was thinking the whole ride in. And, like, you know, I'm getting off the plane. I'm trying to beat the crowd to get over to the, the taxi line because I don't fucking Uber and I never remember to set up a car. So I always go to the fucking taxi line. And what's great at LAX is there's never anybody there because nobody fucking takes a taxi. Everybody's got a friend to pick them up. Um, I, don't, I don't know what the fuck they do. There's always plenty of cabs. So I don't even try to be first in line at the cab stand. I go out of my way over to this duty-free place and I grab this fucking thing, you know? And I just, like bring it up to the counter and the lady goes oh my god she goes fucking uh what a wonderful choice and blah 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 blah. you have great taste i go oh yeah i'm gonna go i'm on the wagon when i come off this is the bottle i'm opening up she goes are you going to canada i said nope i'm going home and she goes oh i'm sorry i can't sell you this and i'm like why not she goes you have to be going to canada something about the duty free and i'm like it's it's legal though do they sell this anywhere else in the airport if you're just going back to your home they're like, no, no, we don't. So, I don't know. So I had a fucking hissy fit. I had a fucking hissy fit. I had two hissy fits. One on the way there to going through Canadian customs when they made me take the, the lime green plastic cover off of my fucking laptop like I somehow had a bomb in there or some sort of bomb residue. And I'm literally taking it off going, I'm going to crack this thing. And they go, well, just try to take it off easily. It's, it's just like, would you look, I look like fucking Howdy Doody. What, what, what? I, I'm in this matrix. I like what's going on. Tell me what you want me to do. The fuck? So they make me take that fucking thing off. I ended up cracking the cover. So I'm already in a bad mood. So rather than, you know, growing up and realizing that these fucking people at the, the what is it? The, the TCA, TCP, whatever the fuck it they are. TA, what is it called? TSA. TSA. The fucking TSA. Rather than just realizing these people are trying to protect me, which I don't think they're trying to do. I think they're trying to make it as inconvenient as fucking possible so I'll agree to have my fucking retina scan so they can share that fucking information and gradually build a fucking robot! Sorry. Put this fucking headphones back. Um, yeah, so all I wanted was a bottle of booze. That's all I wanted. And they wouldn't sell it to me. They wouldn't sell it to me. So I went online and I'll, I'll figure out a fucking place to get it. All right, let's, let's do the little write in here. Um, pharmacist writing in. Uh, Dear Billy Bag Chaser, your rant on pharmacist last week was hilarious. We have to be able, able to laugh at ourselves, right? I just wanted to weigh in on a couple of things. First off, the medication you were prescribed, the anti inflammatory drug you received, was in the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug class. How the fuck do you know? You didn't even look at it. Maybe you just be, ah, no, I can tell just by the way he's talking about it. I understand. Basically, these drugs decrease the formation of prostaglandins and thrombaxinins. Those chemicals are involved in the inflammation process, which itself causes pain. So these drugs can't just decrease inflammation without also decreasing pain thus being labeled a painkiller. Oh, okay. NSAIDs are not in the opioid family. Okay. Are not habit-forming. I don't know what this guy's talking about, but it sounds like he's blowing my argument out of the water. However, they can be very dangerous in susceptible populations. Why can't you say with addicts? Susceptible populations. You guys are such fucking creeps in that world. NSAIDs. N-S-A-I-D-S. NSAIDs <laughs> increase the risk of cardiac events 
Kidney damage and stomach ulcers. Oh, I'm sorry, recovered addicts. Uh, usually in the elderly or those with pre-existing conditions. I'm not sure what the other drug you received was. If it was a narcotic opioid painkiller and the doctor and pharmacist did not discuss it with you, they would be negligible on their part. Since when? Since when? I want to know. Um, now that the uh, the fucking heroin epidemic is completely out of control and the state of Ohio is suing pharmaceutical companies? I guarantee I graduated four years ago and the dangers of narcotics was extremely stressed. Now all the medical bodies are communicating the dangers of narcotics to practitioners and overseeing that prescribing is done appropriately. And maybe this is just the fucking. It's just how we are, you know, like when we first they first had that DDT and they sprayed it all over the place. And this is like, great. We just ended all these plagues and then we did all this damage to the environment. We created this fucking window that is starting to close, I feel where it was this golden age of not having to walk around with the fucking boil on your face and dying of the Black Plague. And um, we just got a little out of control with it, which would have been great is if, as we eradicated all of these different diseases if we somehow didn't grow the population. I feel like that's the sweet spot. I feel like that's what the fucking Illuminati should be discussing, is like what is the optimal number of people, including ourselves, of course, who should be allowed to survive while we keep all the modern day technologies so we can still live this awesome flat screen life with no plagues. But like we also can still sustain like living on this fucking planet. What is that thing? What is what is that number? And they're not taking college because they're a fucking closed entity. All right, let me read a few more of these. How, how much time are we up to at this point? Uh, well, 18, minutes. 18 minutes plus 37 yeah. is 55. Okay, all right, so here we go. Goldmoney.com. Dear Billy Coppernuts, uh, <laughs> I heard you talk about goldmoney.com on your pod- Monday morning podcast. Whoever emailed you about it didn't explain it very well. I feel like all these are just like free commercials. Um, I haven't put any money into it yet, but now I'm going to speak about it as an authority. Uh, but I am considering it as it seems pretty legit. If you listen to Rogan's podcast with Peter Schiff, he explains it pretty well. And makes a good pitch. Yeah, but that guy stands to profit off of it. Granted, Schiff admits that he invested money in the company. Yeah, so he's out. He's out. I want an independent fucking... I don't know. I can't even find that anymore. Evidently, they sell you the gold at a low market price. Half of 1%, I think. What do you mean half of 1% of what? That's just sort of a number floating out there, right? Uh, store it for you in a vault of your choosing with your name on it. And if you want it, they will actually mail your gold to you for free. Minimum of like five grams or something. You also get a MasterCard debit card that you can use to spend your gold slash money. Evidently, you can use, you can even get a debit card that is made of real gold, which sounds fucking baller. The Federal Reserve and powers that May be may never let it work, but it seems like a great idea at least. Thanks and go fuck yourself. Yeah, there's a bunch of great ideas. Yeah, I'm all set on that. Hey, you give me your cash and uh, we'll put it in gold in a vault that you choose. That's not where you can see it. Um, all right. Dating in Saudi Arabia. Uh, may- maybe. I don't know. I, it sounds like uh, even if they're they're mind is in the right place, it's going to go belly up and then they're all going to write themselves bonus checks off your gold. That's what I would guess would happen. Or the Federal Reserve will come in and say this is all illegal and take all the gold and then act like it's in Fort Knox when it's really fucking, uh, I don't know. I don't know where the fuck it is. Somewhere in the Hamptons. All right. Dating in Saudi Arabia. Hey there, Billy Billy the Pie Maker. Hope you're having a great day. Anyways, I wanted your advice on this problematic shit that I'm stuck in. I met this lady through a common friend of ours. Oh, God. We talk. And this is, this is going to get messy when you break up with her. Then you're going to lose her and a friend. Uh, we talked. She's a really cool person. We got a lot of things in common. Then we met again twice as a friend. And now I want to ask her out. But here's the thing. She is Egyptian and I'm Indian. And we live in Saudi Arabia, Arabia and dating is illegal here. Well, then what the fuck did you go out with her for? Now your heart's going to get cause you to get your fucking, what do they do? If they beat your feet in the square, they're going to fucking slap your dick around in public or something, whatever the punishment is over there. I mean, the authority could deport you immediately or worse, send you to jail for years. Now, I really like this girl more than your freedom. 
All right. Now, I really like this girl. And I like, you're not even love this girl. And I've already thought of of names for our kids before she even said yes to me. But I'm really st- stuck on thinking through my brain. OK, this is second language here. I'm going to try to help this out here. But I'm really stuck here. What should, should I think through my brain or through my dick? Uh, should I? Well, dude, none of that is your heart. So you should just leave. Should I ask her out and open for a whole another level of problems or should I just shut the fuck up? Any advice from you is highly appreciated. Love the podcast and love you as a brother. Go fuck yourself. There's not a woman or a man out there worth going to fucking prison in Saudi Arabia. I know how bad the prisons are over here. I don't know what they're like over there. You guys got a lot of oil money? Although I did run into this guy from Saudi Arabia who's laughing his ass off at me. He goes, dude, we don't, we don't all have oil money. And I was just like, all right, fair enough. There's oil men over here. I don't have any of that money. Yeah, dude, I would walk away from this shit. It's fucking illegal. You could go to jail. You could get deported. You know what I mean? And even if you love somebody, they're going to annoy the shit out of you. So, I mean, is that worth going to jail for? You know, I don't mean, Is it illegal to just bang her? But then if you love her, I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 would, I would get out of that. Uh, I'd get out of that. All right. All right. Great movie scene. Unknown actor. All right. Oh, yeah. I was talking about... Uh, this is the... Uh, this is a new topic here where I was talking about actors that you saw just do like five lines in a fucking movie and they absolutely destroyed it and you and your friends still quote them you don't even know their fucking names i brought up that guy last week the guy from pulp uh reservoir dogs the guy in you know when tim roth's character is uh what is he he's in the fucking bathroom and that cop's telling that story i said buddy i am gonna shoot you in the face you don't put your fucking hands in that dashboard love that guy so here he goes. One of my favorite scenes with an unknown actor was Kill Bill 2. Bill's brother, Bud. I wish I need to see these movies to do this justice. I mean, I saw this, but I don't remember it. Um, she, she wore the same outfit, that fucking yellow outfit in both movies, didn't she? Bill's brother, Bud, is working as a bouncer at a rundown strip club. He shows up late for work, gets called into his boss's office. His boss, Larry Gomez, is played by actor Larry Bishop, and he looks like half a wolf man. After doing a line of blow with a haggard-looking stripper, oh, I vaguely remember this, he levels his gaze at Buzz and Bud and says, uh, I don't know what car wash you worked before you came here. They let you stroll in 20 minutes late, but it wasn't owned by you, but oh, well, it wasn't owned by me, and I own a fucking car wash. I just butchered that line. People, I can't read. I've realized that I need glasses and I have slight dyslexia. Um... Like, I was trying to write squawk today, and I knew all the letters, and I just could not remember. So I was trying to remember what squawking 7,700 versus 7,500. I always get those two mixed up. If that's an emergency landing or a fucking hijacking, I was, because one stay alive, and the other is fucking go to heaven. Um, All right. Sorry, that's how you remember it. 75, stay alive. 77, go to heaven. All right. 75 is hijacking, 77 is emergency. And 76, need a fix, means your fucking radio is out. This doesn't mean anything to you guys. Um, I don't know what car wash you worked before you came here that let you stroll in 20 minutes late, but it wasn't owned by me and I own a fucking car wash. There you go. That was a good fucking read. That makes me want to go see that movie. He said he then proceeded to give this world-class assassin a humiliating dress down, telling him he's as useless as an asshole on his elbow and crossing off all his scheduled work days on the calendar. He finishes by telling him never to wear his cowboy hat to work and has him cleaned a clogged toilet on his way out. All Bud can do is stand there and take it. I hope you've seen this great movie. If not, it's worth the watch. Thanks and go fuck yourself. I'm going to go watch it again. All right. I think I think this bit is going to make people go see these cool movies again, and it's also going to make everybody laugh at how bad I can't fucking read out loud. All right, Bill, my favorite line in a comedy ever might be from Blazing Saddles, delivered by Slim Pickens. He rides into the scene where his workers are singing uh, camp. Is it Cam Town Races? I always thought it was Camp Cam Town Races, and says, "What in the wide wide world a sport is going on here?" I hired you people to try to get I hired you people to try to get a little track laid, not to jump around like a bunch of Kansas City faggots. I remember that line. Whatever the hell that means. And I'm quoting a movie, by the way, before everybody gets all fucking uptight about that. 
you know, Richard Pryor wrote on that. And he was actually supposed to be the lead in that. And then they went with the, the other actor. And I don't know any of the actors' names. Okay. Three. Number three. Bill, you asked for movie lines said by a non-movie star actress that your listeners' friends talked about. For my group of friends, it's a line from Ghostbusters. When Peter Venkman, uh, Bill Murray, shows up to Dana's W. Weaver apartment right after the dog monster runs loose from Lewis Tully. I've never seen that movie. I've never seen Ghostbusters. Just not a sci-fi guy. Venk- is that considered sci-fi? Venkman shows up to the scene and asks a cop, what happened? And the cop nonchalantly replies, uh, some moron brought a cougar to a party and it went berserk. <laughs> <laughs> my friends and I have been quoting that cop for years check it out at 2.30 of the following oh I can I can look at these fuck I can click on the links this is even better why have me read it when I can click on the links alright we'll compare my read come on boys the way you lollygagging around here with them picks and them shovels you think it was 120 degrees can't be more than 100 <laughs> Fourteen. <laughs> when you were slaves, you sang like birds. Come on, how about a good old nigger work song? Jesus Christ, what the fuck kind of link are you sending me here? I thought that was going to go to your fucking... Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Am I going to have to have an apology video here? What the fuck just happened? All right, let's... Do I do this other one? This is why... How you doing? Why do you have some of the brie? It's at room temperature. You think it's too warm in here for the brie? Louis, I'm going home. I don't leave yet. All right, fuck all these things. These things are going to be too long, and evidently they, they have the N-word in them. Oh, boy. Do I need to take a knee after this one? All right, number four. I have two unknown and unheralded actors with memorable movie lines. Both are the great Mel Brooks movies. Uh, the first one is the Roman soldier in the history of the world part one the empress is approaching but the, there's a horse and a carriage in the way the Roman soldier looks directly at the camera and says move that miserable piece of shit uh, the over the top way he delivers the line comes out of nowhere I say it all the time in the, uh, in the best impression I can do you know what I gotta do I have to get the actual clips for this to work because what I'm now doing is ruining I'm ruining great movies alright girlfriend believes in ghosts uh, all right. Girlfriend believes in ghosts. Dear Grandmaster B, I met this lady a few weeks ago. Things went really good. She's very cool. I found her good looking and we have a lot of stuff to talk about. I didn't have a great a lot of I didn't have a lot of relationships in the past. I'm 32 and I picked up my game about four years ago. Everything was great until we went to a restaurant one day and she told me she believes in ghosts. Not just that. She said she actually sees them and even got patience who come to her for treatment about it. I tried to be open-minded about it. Oh, my God. I can just hear the silverware hitting the plates at this point. Trying to compare it to people who believe in God. But her believing in this keeps bugging me. I'm not saying she's crazy or wrong. Who am I to know? But she doesn't sit right the way I see the world. Well, then fucking drop her. This is the thing now. There's this whole fucking straight across the board you have to look at everything like all the leaves are brown and the sky is gray like if you're dating and somebody does something and it makes your body you just body literally go like what the fuck and then you're literally you're gonna fight that feeling and go well maybe i need to stop being so ghostophobic it's like no it's fucking ghosts it's weird you know, you, you're going to fucking live with Whoopi Goldberg's character from Ghost. That's what you're going to do. People trying to sit on her and shit. Trying to sit on your wife. That's what you're going to sign up for. I mean, if that's what you're into, by all means, do it. But if you're on a date and there's like, that's a major fucking thing. Because it's not like she just believes in it. And every once in a while, she's going to hear like a thump in the house and start telling you it's a ghost when you're like, honey, it's fucking air in the pipes. All right. We just have to fucking turn on the faucet. You know, and it'll, you know. Remember, the plumber did work today and they shut it off for a second. That, that's what that is. You know, that's not that. She actually, she's going to become like a ghost hunter and all of that stuff. And uh, gradually she's going to get, start dressing more and more like she can predict the future. And you don't want to fuck that. You know what I mean? When they start wearing those long flowing things, you know, just, you just so many layers of clothes to try to pick up to just get it going, you know? You start wearing, like, curtains and shit. You don't need that. Anyways, all right. Um, sorry that whole fucking movie thing just, I don't know. Can you guys just send me the goddamn clip? 
Or I guess you sent me the clip. What I should have done was cue it up. I tried to do too many things. I tried to promote shit. I tried to do all that and then do the whole thing. The whole fucking thing just fell apart. All right. Let me just finish with this last thing. Uh, a buddy of mine is opening a fucking uh, a new comedy club on the Upper West Side in Manhattan. Okay? Friday, October 6th and October 7th. It's like a little 100-seat fucking club. I'm, I'm going to be coming to town in November, and I'm going to pop in and do a spot. I love little clubs like that. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Russ Maneev's going to be there. Greer Barnes, Mark Norman, John Fish, Sherrod Small, Brian S- Scott McFadden, uh, and many more. It's going to be a great show. Uh, if you're on the Upper East Side, I'm mean, Upper West Side, sorry. It's on uh, 201 West 75th Street. It's right next to the Beacon Theater. Which is also cool. You know what I mean? You go in there and you fucking do your spots and you come out and you go, wow, someday I'll be across the street. It's tremendous. Give it a shot. If you're in town, uh, Friday, October 6th and October 7th, I got the hiccups. That's the podcast. Please check out Felipe Esparza's new uh, stand-up special. Um, what's it called? Translate this September 30th on HBO at 10 p.m. This feels more like indigestion. I haven't even eaten today. All right, go fuck yourselves. I'll check in on you on Thursday.